Psalm 69, if you would please be turned there in your Bibles. That will be the text of our lesson this evening, but I'm going to start off with, I think that the Apostle Paul was looking at this particular psalm, when, and that's what he had in mind when he wrote to the church of Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, or the old King James says to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world produces death. You see, David had grievously sinned against God and against men. And the fact that he had taken Bathsheba, committed adultery, and in the process of trying to cover that up, he had he lied to Uriah the Hittite, he tried to deceive him, he got him drunk, he did several things, ended up having him murdered. Because in the heat of battle, he had his captain withdraw the forces, leaving Uriah there to die on his own. But God said that was murder. So he sinned, he attempted to cover it up, but when he did, it only made the matters worse. It just compounded what he had done. So realizing that the only way to deal with his sin was to confess it, repent of it, make the proper sacrifice for it, uh, he was able to do so. But that brings us a list of things as David contemplates. Number one, the shame of sin, the reproach of sin, how it affects a righteous man, and really then gives us an idea how it affects an unrighteous man. How an unrighteous man would deal with sin in his life, and the fact is, well, he just would not deal with it. So as we look at this, first of all, we see the shame of sin, and that's in the first four verses. Listen to this. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me, or attack me with lies. What I did not steal, must I now restore? Going down to verse 5 here. Oh God, you know my folly, the wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. And what we have here is a picture of David saying, this is what sin has done to me. This is the condition sin has put me in. I'm stuck. I'm stuck and I'm about to be overwhelmed with shame and with guilt. How many of you watched the miniseries Centennial when it was on TV? The once or twice or whatever that it was on. You remember right in the, the very beginnings of it, well, maybe it wasn't the very beginnings of it, but, but very early in it, there was a young man by the name of Levi Zent. And Levi Zent was a Quaker, and that's why we were talking about the pew shaking earlier, right? The Quakers. But he was a Quaker. But he was a rambunctious Quaker. And that's a contradiction in terms, isn't it? Because you're not supposed to be a rambunctious Quaker. There are several movies. I remember the one with uh, Gary Cooper where he was a rambunctious. His wife was a Quaker, and he was rambunctious. That might be just a little bit different from But see... He was a rambunctious Quaker because <coughs> he wanted to get into the shipping business, which meant horses and wagon. Horses and wagon. And they had a tradition there with those teamsters that they carried a bell on their wagon. And as they go along, the, the bell would ring. But if they ever got stuck in the mud and somebody had to pull them out, they had to give them their bell. And it was a shame to lose your bell. You didn't want to go into town without your bell. That meant you couldn't do it on your own. That meant, meant you needed help. And that's kind of the way that David is here. 
He's gotten to a position where he cannot do anything on his own to overcome the shame and the guilt that he has for what sins he's committed. Adultery, lying, murder. There's simply nothing he can do on his own for that. Now, there's a man by the name of Gary Collins. And he is a psychologist, I believe. But he's a psychologist who believes in God. So he takes a very uh, conservative approach to things as he looks and tries to help people. But he said this, talk with people who are depressed, lonely, struggling with marriage problems, homosexual, alcoholic, grieving, dealing with middle age, or facing almost any other problem, and you will find people who experience guilt as part of their difficulties. One writer has even suggested that guilt in some way is involved in all psychological problems. And that's what we talk about, that the human being, body, mind, and spirit, Sometimes there are physical problems that cause us emotional problems and spiritual problems. Sometimes there are emotional problems that cause us physical problems, psychosomatic illnesses, and cause us spiritual problems. And sometimes the spiritual. A spiritual problem will cause us emotional and physical damage. And that is the hardest <coughs> one to understand because there are millions of people, well, today we can say billions of people, who are out here in the world and they're struggling because of the effect of sin. Struggling, hurt because of the shame and guilt of sin <coughs> and they can't even recognize it. They don't know what's going on in their life because it's a spiritual problem. And they're not spiritual minded. So they try to work their things out just like David did. See, David committed this sin. And then instead of repenting and taking care of the problem in a spiritual way, he tried to solve the problem in a physical, material, earthly, worldly way. He had to ride a Hittite murder. Did that relieve his guilt? Did that relieve the shame of what he had done? Absolutely not. What did it do? It compounded it. So you see what he says? I was stuck in the mud. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do it. And you know, all those people in the palace were whispering behind his back. Oh, see what David did, and now look what he's done. I thought he was a man of God. I thought he was someone who, who trusted in God completely. I, I thought surely David would have done the right thing. But he didn't. Guilt had brought him to that position. So to a righteous person, someone who truly believes in God, it's shameful to sin. No excuses can overcome. Blame it on somebody else. No. Oh, I'm just human. Yeah, we're all human, but God expects us to be more than human as Christians. He expects us to step up and do the right thing when we have sin. So David says, again, it's like falling in the mud and not being able to get out on your own. You know, it's not funny when somebody slips and falls in it is funny when somebody slips and falls in the mud, isn't it? Yeah, you see them sliding around, you know, fall oh, you know, like that. It's not funny when it's me that falls in the mud. It's not funny when it's you who falls in the mud. And sometimes that's the way we treat sin. It's just like, oh, he fell in the mud. <laughs> How silly. How funny, he fell in the mud. And maybe it would be funny, except for the fact that, that puts the individual's soul in danger of eternal condemnation. Sin is not funny business. Sin brings shame. Sin brings guilt. The same did with Adam and Eve. What happens? They sin, and immediately, guilt, shame. 
And they began hiding from God, the, the person who could help them. And they hide from Him. Who told you you sinned? Nobody had to tell them. They knew it, didn't they? The minute they did, they, they knew because the sin and the, the shame and the guilt came upon them. Sin's not funny to God. But even worse for David, there he was. He was stuck in the mud and what's coming? A tidal wave. Tidal wave. Watch the movie here. I love to watch movies sometimes. Lots of times. But it was an old Paul Newman movie. And it was about logging up in Oregon or Washington or somewhere along the Columbia River, I believe, or one of those little rivers there. And, and anyway, uh, they would cut down the trees, the big trees, and the, ship them down to the river and put them on the river and make big floats out of them to take them down to the mill. And, and his brother, he, were work, he and his brother were working and something happened, a, a log shifted, and his brother got caught under it, in the mud, under the log, with the tide rising. And his brother drowned in the movie. He's trying to save him. He's trying to cut the log, and the, the chainsaw quits on him. And there's nothing he can do but tie him to the log, flag the log, and tell his other brother, there's a, a log coming down, it's flag, get it. My brother's on there. He's gone. And that's what David was facing here. He's stuck in the mud. He can't get out, and the tide is rising. So you can see how that shame and guilt is working on him. And he wants a way out, doesn't he? But he doesn't see a way out. Because if he confesses, people are going to look down on him. If he repents, goes, tells the priest, makes a sacrifice or whatever, people are going to look at Pride. <coughs> Pride has entered into the picture that he doesn't want to do what God, what, what he really needs to do for God to heal him. So, the next part is the reproach of the righteous. Look at verses 5 through 12. Oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. <clears throat> we can hide a lot of things from men, but we can't hide our sins from God. God knows everything, and God understands it all. He understands the processes that go through there. So, verse 6, Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me. When we don't do the right thing, when we sin, what kind of an example do we set before others? What kind of an example do we set before the non-believers if we as Christians refuse to admit that we have sinned and refuse to do what's necessary to have the sin taken away so that the shame and the guilt can be gone? You see... That sets up a lot of hypocrisy, doesn't it? That's exactly what happens. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, David said. Let not those who seek you, God, don't let me be the stumbling stone that somebody who's seeking God will fall over and say, I don't want anything to do with that Christianity stuff because look how that Christian's acting. Look at their life. I see the sin. I see the effect in shame and guilt in their life. But they're in denial. They're in denial that they could ever sin, and their pride is keeping them from doing what needs to be done. And see, that's David. That's David right here in this passage. Verse 7, For it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. For God's sake, 
What does he mean? I think that's kind of wrapped around this that, you know, if there wasn't a God, I could just go out here and do anything that I wanted. But but I, see, David says, I'm, I'm the king and I was allowed to do this. No, he wasn't. And now, for God's sake, he's got to step up and do the right thing. Which means what? He's going to be reproached for what he's done. He's publicly, publicly going to be reproached. Publicly, he's going to be humiliated because of what he's done. I have become a stranger to my brothers, he says. An alien to my mother's sons. They didn't want anything to do with him. Why? Remember back when David went out to check out the battle? And his, what does his brother say? Well, you, you just come out here because you wanted to see a battle. You're sticking your nose in here where you don't belong. See, his brothers didn't like him any more than Joseph's brothers didn't like Joseph. Why? Because he was a man of God. He was a man of God. Brethren, even men of God sometimes fail. Even men of God will sin. But a man of God won't cover it up. A man of God will do what he needs to do so that he does not become an obstacle to those who are seeking God. Verse 9, for zeal your house has consumed me. I want to be your child, God. I want to be your servant, God. I really want to be. At an acceptable time, O oh God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. God, tell me it's all right. But God's not saying it's okay. God isn't saying, it's okay, David. I, I, I'll overlook your sin because you're the king. Because you're a very important person, David. See, God won't overlook our sins because we are preachers or elders or teachers or important people in the community. God doesn't do that. That would make God a respecter of person. And if there's anything that God is not, He's not a respecter of persons. He deals with everybody in the same way. So that's what's going on with David. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Get me out of this, God. God will get him out of it, right? Let me be delivered from my enemies and from, and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me, or the deep swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. So David says, God, get me out of this. God, please, please get me out of this. Get me over this. And God does. What does he do? He sends Nathan to him. <laughs> he sends the prophet Nathan with a story. See, it's easier to talk about a person's sin than it is to try to restore the person. We'll just talk about it, we'll make fun about it, and talk behind the person's back. But see, a godly person tries to restore the sinner. Because that soul is valuable. It, it, it's worth something. Everyone was talking behind David's back about what a terrible thing he had done. Nathan had the moral courage to bring David's sin into the open. Nathan, don't you know he's the king? You go and tell him he sinned and he's going to cut your head off. Look what he did to Uriah, the Hittite. <laughs> Look what he did to him. Nathan, do you want that same thing to happen to you? But see... Nathan was a man of God. And he knew that when God told him to do something, he needed to do it. And even if it would have cost Nathan his life, he was going to obey God. Oh, that we had such courage. Oh, that we had such 
faith. You see, David could no longer hide his sin. Everybody knew it. Nobody was really talking publicly about it until here comes Nathan. Now, after David's repentance, his enemies had nothing to reproach him about. Right? Once David stood up and said, I committed adultery, I lied about it, I got Uriah drunk, and I had him murdered, everything his enemies had that they could say, oh, you're a terrible person and, and you're not a person of God because you did those things, he admits them and he gets God's forgiveness and now they can't, they can't use that against him, can they? And that's where the shame and the guilt then get to be lifted from the individual. When it's godly sorrow. See, what he had before was the worldly sorrow. He was just sorry he got caught and he was stuck in the mud. But now, see, there's a godly sorrow and a repentance that's coming for him. See, only fools would continue to mock David's moral courage to confess and repent. Only fools. Now, the further down, see, from 13, verse, verse 13 through 28, you have David's prayer of repentance. And it's kind of in three separate stages here. And, and I won't read that whole thing, but just in verses 13 through 15, see, it, it, it's not to the point where David is saying, uh, God, take away the sin and the guilt. He's saying, God, save my life. Why, why, why would he be saying, save, save my life? Well, because the law said that if you get caught in adultery, you're supposed to be stoned to death. And if you kill an innocent man, shed innocent blood, you're supposed to be stoned to death. He was worthy of death. And if he hadn't repented, that's what he was going to get. Rightfully. Justly. But because he repented, he received mercy. Oh, how terrible. He hadn't been merciful to Uriah. Right. right. He was going to have opportunity to be merciful to others. To a lot of other people the rest of his life. Let's see. He received that mercy from God. Doesn't mean there wasn't any heartache. Doesn't mean there wasn't any trials and tribulations going on further. But he was able to take it away. Mercy is the guilty person not receiving the just punishment for his crime. And that's what he received. Secondly, verses 16 through 19, he's saying, Restore my spirit. Restore my spirit. Take away the shame and the guilt and make me joyous in you, Lord, once again. Do you think that when David sinned and was feeling like he was stuck in the mud, that he wanted to go down to the temple? Tabernacle, excuse me. Till David's time. Go down to the tabernacle and sing and worship God and pray and give a sacrifice? Do you think he wanted to do that? No, that's why he's stuck in the mud. How could he go down there? You know, there are lots of people that go to church and they've got sin and they've got the shame and the guilt and they can still go and they can sit there. Probably don't have a conscience. That says, you know, I'm undone. I'm undone because of my sin. Restore my spirit to what it used to be before I sinned. And that's what he's needing. That's what he's wanting. The very first part of verse 18. Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. What, what does James say? And I think that's coming from the Old Testament. Draw nigh unto God and what will happen? 
God will draw nigh unto you. He'll restore you. He'll set you up in the first place. But even as a Christian, if you say, he'll restore you. So he sold him, David had sold himself back into slavery to sin. And he needed to be redeemed from that. So godly sorrow leading to true repentance was the only, only avenue to take away the guilt of sin. And if the guilt of sin wasn't taken away, he was going to continue to be that depressed, guilty, ineffective, lousy, attitude, attitude, person. I created a new word, guys. You can borrow it anytime you want to. Do you see what see what's going on there? Worldly sorrow, sorrow for being overtaken in the sin, cripples, cripples the body and the mind and the spirit. And unless there's something spiritual to come along to restore the spirit. To redeem the soul once again. It's going to languish there in that lost state. Uh, let's see, verse 26. What does David say in verse 26? For they persecuted him whom you have struck down, and they recount the pain of those who have wounded you, or you have wounded. And, and what David is saying there is that, you know, again, going back to what I said earlier, only a fool would continue to persecute David after David had made a full confession, offered repentance, made the sacrifices, and God had forgiven him. Only a fool would continue to persecute David. So he says, take vengeance on those who refuse to forgive. And that's the basic sentiment there for verses 20 through 28. When God's justice is satisfied, there's no reason to pile on. When God's justice is satisfied. But the problem is, we don't always go by God's justice. We want to go by our own justice. So the flip side of that is don't take vengeance on those who have been forgiven. Just don't do it. And that's how David would be restored. But see, as we draw this to a close, there's an order that goes on here, okay? A, a proper order, the true order of worship. First, it's personal and private, and that's verses 29 through 33. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Let's look what David says. But I'm afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. And what's the theme of that? Same as James chapter 4 and verse 10. Humble yourself in the sight of God and He will lift you up. But see, we can't lift our own selves up out of the mud. We've got to allow Him to do it. And then... See, that's a personal and private thing that we've got to trust in God. We've got to have that relationship with God through Jesus Christ, each and every one of us. doesn't come by a group setting. No, that comes by the individual trusting in God. But then there's a, a corporate and public aspect of this, verses 34 through 36, let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and people will dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. And what's David saying? David says, well, you know, when we do it right as individuals, that corporately helps so that the church can continue to grow and be strengthened and be strong and perpetuate itself into the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. There's no reason for churches to die. When God says, when Jesus says, I'll make them alive. There's no reason for it. Except we go back to sin and guilt and refusal to repent 
and turn to God. And finally, God gets so frustrated with us that He just takes out our candlestick. He just takes it out and says, I don't know them. don't know them anymore. Well, that's our lesson for this evening. But remember those, that you see how David shows that connection between sin and shame and guilt and what it does to us as individuals, how it freezes us like a deer in the headlights so that we really can't be productive in his kingdom. But when we turn to him and allow him when we humble ourselves and allow Him to lift us up, then great things can happen. Thank you for your time. The lesson is yours. If you have need, see, we ask you to come. Take a seat here in the front as we stand and sing the invitation song.